At the time of the Constitution in the U.S., the only people who were working to organize the Constitution and organize the country were sort of elites from the colonies. So people with a fair amount of money, a fair amount of resources, and who could vote was propertied white men over 21. It's not that different from who was included in the franchise in most other places. So it wasn't sort of a, a shockingly exclusive approach. And in fact, it was, you know, more democratic than lots of places at that time, but still looked awfully exclusive if you were uh, poor or female or, you know, a slave. One way to think about the history of voter eligibility in the U.S. is this sort of arc of increasing inclusion. So the first restriction that was lifted was the property restriction, and between about 1790s and I think the last exclusion was lifted in 1856, all white men over 21 were eligible to vote. After the Civil War, a number of amendments passed to the Constitution that made it uh, possible and legal for African Americans to vote and to be sort of fully included in American society. Uh, that period is called Reconstruction, and it didn't last very long. So shortly after that, uh, Democrats, uh, who were the party of slave owners in the South, got control of the Southern leg legislators and brought in all sorts of new policies that, while they didn't change voting requirements at the sort of federal level, excluded African Americans and also many poor whites from voting. The states couldn't officially, formally pass laws that said African Americans may no longer vote in the state because there was a constitutional amendment that said African Americans were entitled to be full citizens. Uh, so what they did was pass things like uh, poll taxes, which is you had to pay in order to vote, uh, literacy and comprehension tests, which were incredibly difficult um, if, if you were actually illiterate, but also difficult even if you were literate and were ununiformly enforced, so that uh, poor whites might have been able to pass them or might have been informally granted an exemption from a poll tax, uh, whereas uh, African Americans were held to the sort of very highest standards on these tests. And the tests were designed to be essentially impossible. The sort of final thing that did it was the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and that um, imposed fairly strict federal guidelines about how voting had to be organized in the states, specifically to ensure that African Americans were not kept from voting by any of these sorts of um, unequal impact types of laws. Women got the right to vote in 1920. The current eligibility is citizen over 18, and that's basically it, except that there are felon disenfranchisement laws in a number of states. Some states are left that have a permanent felon disenfranchisement, that even after you've served your term, you're still not allowed to vote for the rest of your life. Um, that's only a couple states. Uh, Virginia just recently got rid of its felon disenfranchisement policy. But most places, you, you can't vote if you're in prison. Because African Americans are disproportionately sent to prison, um, they get higher sentences for the same crimes than whites, they um, are prosecuted more for the same crimes than whites, etc. They're sort of disproportionately overrepresented in the criminal justice system at every stage. That means they're also overrepresented in penitentiaries, in prisons, as felons, and so they're overrepresented among the group, among the people who are not allowed to vote. A lot of people were concerned that uh, part of why we had so much inequality in political participation in the U.S. was because of sort of onerous registration requirements. Um, a bunch of reforms were passed to make voting easier, the motor voter law, other reforms like that. What is, appears to have happened, however, is that it actually doesn't do very much to increase equality in voting or to decrease political inequality. The easier voting is, the more people who are going to vote anyway vote and uh, the people who weren't going to vote anyway still don't. Um, so you actually get more inequality when it's easier to vote, which is not the expectation that anybody who pushed for those reforms thought would happen. A few groups of American citizens who also don't have the right to vote in national level elections who are worth thinking about, and those are people in D.C. and the U.S. territories. All of national level uh, politics happens through the states, and if you don't live in a state, you essentially have no representation at the national level. Um, so people in Washington, D.C. Uh, get a delegate to the House of Representatives, but not an actual representative who can vote uh, to actually decide who will be the president, um, and similarly in the U.S. territories. I mean, I think in terms of uh, 
how many people are technically eligible, it's a pretty good, it's pretty good. It could be better. Uh, felon disenfranchisement and and prisoner disenfranchisement is a big concern. Um, the you know the territories in DC are a big concern, um, but in terms of technical eligibility, most adults are technically eligible to vote. Um, I think what's a bigger concern is the inequality in who actually participates um, and the ways that that means that the national level politics and state level politics are not representative of the actual population.